And my guest today who is going to help us in this classroom is uh, Mihir Vora, Chief Investment Officer at Trust Mutual Fund. Mihir, thank you very much. Uh, and it's uh, great to have you. I think this is the first time we're having you on Let's Talk Money. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure. So, you know, uh, this is something that uh, we talk about a lot of times when we're doing our personal finance conversations. And I must admit that for most viewers, even the queries that we get, it all boils down to, okay, tell me which is going to be the best fund for the next one year. And when a viewer or an investor asks about the best fund, typically it's all about performance. But hey, is that really such a bad thing? <laughs> <laughs> it is about performance at the end of the day, right? Ultimately, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, one must also realize that you are in charge of the performance of your overall portfolio. Mm -hmm. So while, mm -hmm. while you might select a fund based on the recent performance, mm -hmm. You, as an investor, are supposed to take the view for the longer term mm -hmm. because you have some longer term objectives in mind. Mm -hmm. You know, right now, for the last five, seven years, the stock markets have become so glamorized. You know? <laughs> and, and plus, this is the first time probably that we have so much social media, mm -hmm. so much buzz apart mm -hmm. from the TV channels, etc. Yeah. So there's a lot of noise and it's become more of a glamour activity rather than a, you know, <laughs> a, I say, a, a pool planned activity. So yeah. I think it's time that somebody, you know, steps back and takes a longer term yeah. view and plan it out. I think and that's especially important now, right? Because we see this market hitting all-time highs on a daily basis. But you and I have known, even I have been around covering this business for such a long time, that that's not typically how cycles work. Uh, there are periods of underperformance, and that's where you need to know that you've done the right thing uh, with your portfolio. So let's start with the basics. I mean, where should one begin? If you want to have a very holistic approach to creating a mutual fund portfolio, then what's the starting point? Uh so as I said, there is so much noise and there's so yeah. much you know, you know, glamour these days in mm -hmm. stock trading and investment that we tend to forget the bigger picture. The bigger mm -hmm. picture is that, yes, investing is an art mm -hmm. and a science. It's a combination of both. Yeah. But your life goal planning, your mm -hmm. financial goal planning is more of a science, I would say. Mm -hmm. So your goal planning, your financial uh, you know, uh, uh, achievements that you want to you know, uh, 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 attain mm -hmm. by a certain age, by a certain mind, so that are very scientific. Because... Sure. The, sure. the one thing that you know is yourself, yeah. right? And you should know yourself. Yeah. What are your aspirations? Yeah. What are your lifestyle ambitions? What is your age? Mm. What is your risk profile? What is your social mm. background? Mm -hmm. Based on all this, you will know what you need to do in life. Mm. What are your life events? For example, mm -hmm. as a 25-year-old, mm. if you want to own a house by 35 or 40 years, you mm. know what are the returns that you need to? Mm. What are the savings that you need to uh, mm. do? What mm. are the returns that you need to generate? Mm. If you are a 40-year-old, is your is, is your you know uh, kids education your immediate uh, concern mm -hmm. so education marriage how these are all big financial goals that we need to plan for and these this can be done in a very scientific fashion because you know your age and your profile oh, absolutely so you need to start by defining some of your sort of more quantifiable aspects of absolutely. where you want to get in life absolutely uh, by the way i must tell our viewers that while i was looking at the data points that you had sent us before the show there is a 3d approach and i want you to elaborate on it so what are the three d's viewers that mayor is talking about he's saying define decide and then do the due diligence so why don't you expand on these three d's certainly <laughs> so as i said first of all the the description mm -hmm. of your profile and mm -hmm. your ambition and your life goals mm -hmm. is what you what what would form part of definition mm -hmm. so you look at your age you look at your liability profile mm -hmm. and plan out you know five one year down the line do you need some money uh, maybe you want to you know go for a vacation so that's a shorter term goal mm -hmm. five years down the line do you want to start buying a house so that's the second goal Mm -hmm. uh, 15 years down the line, 20 years down the line, are you planning to have kids and for their education, do you need money? Yeah. 25 years down the line, maybe you need money for their wedding. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and, and similarly, if you're a 40-year-old, yeah. probably you need to start planning for retirement true, you know, true, for the true, next 20 years. So uh, look at your lifestyle ambition, look at your uh, goals. Because again, there are certain people who are very conservative, they don't, they don't have a flashy lifestyle, so their current consumption is not very high. Mm. But certain people have societal or individual requirements, they want to consume more, mm -hmm. then probably they need to generate more returns from their portfolio. Uh -huh. <laughs> but you know, let me ask you one thing, that uh, today a lot of your investors are not even millennials, probably Gen Z, right? And here are the classic definitions of goal-based planning about, you know, this certain age marriage and then kids and all of that. It's very dynamic. So I don't know if your newer investors can actually plan for the next 20, 30 years. So then how should they approach goal-based investing? The point is, you should be aware that these are factors. Okay. A lot of us just run through life, enjoying <laughs> watching movies and Netflix and all that, without even stepping back and thinking, what am I going to do for, for the next five or ten years, you know? Mm. So, uh, things are structured if you want them to be. Yeah. Otherwise, you can just, you know, uh, go along and, and, and then after 10, 15 years, suddenly there are people who don't have any savings. 
yeah. at 40, 45, and suppose you lose your job, yeah. what do you do? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So those are the things that one That's needs to step back and think about. You need to plan. Okay. So, so then... that that was on the definition uh, part. Mm -hmm. Then of course, once you have the goals defined, mm -hmm. then you decide what your portfolio allocation mm -hmm. can look like. And frankly, now there are many tools available on the internet. But mm -hmm. a good financial advisor can you know run run you through the process. I think I personally believe it's still a high touch uh, you know, uh, issue. Mm -hmm. So you should find a good financial advisor, even if your corpus is small, mm -hmm. because. Financial advisors will also take a longer term view on you because you are also going to grow in your career. So yeah. they want to develop a new, you know, mm -hmm. lo a long term relationship. Mm -hmm. so define the, once you know your asset liability profile, your yeah. own self, yeah. then you uh, decide on the portfolio. That's the second sure. D. Okay. Uh, so so what, what should be the asset mix? Yeah. And then a good portfolio, if you're planning for the next 15, 20, 30 years, it will be changing dynamically. Sure. So at sure. early part, you will have more risky assets in the portfolio. Yeah. At the yeah. later stage of life, you'll start trimming and rebalancing your portfolio towards safer assets. Sure. So all that can yes. be planned out in advance. And yeah. at least you have some map in which direction and you want to go. And how you want to sort of go about it. And, then and, the, and the third is, of course, uh, the, the, the diligence part. Yeah. As I said, you know, once you once you set out uh, and you've done your initial asset, periodically, maybe six monthly, maybe yearly, mm -hmm. just again, take a look whether mm -hmm. things are going as per plan or there's some, you know, uh, dynamic change that you need to do. And as I said, as, as you mature, your asset allocation itself will change. So that itself, the plan itself might require some diligence and reallocation of assets. Fair point. So those are the three Ds that should define our sort of investment mindset. You know, I want to take up a question here because I think it's very much in sync with what you're saying. Uh, and this is actually coming in from uh, one of our uh, young viewers as well. Uh, this is Nidhi. I think we have uh, Nidhi with us uh, on the phone line. Yeah, Nidhi, hi. Welcome to Let's Talk Money. Thank you so much for joining in. Tell us, what's your query? Hi, my name is Nidhi. I'm a 26-year-old working professional. I want to build enough corpus to help me buy a house in 10 years. How do I select a good mid to high risk mutual fund to invest my money in? I can invest up to 10,000 rupees a month. There you go, Mehir. So we've discussed the theory. It's time to put it to practice. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> so, how, so how would, uh, you know, how should uh, someone like Nidhi looking at a uh, 10-year horizon and buying a house, how should they start with a mutual fund portfolio? Certainly. Mm -hmm. So first of all, congratulations, Nidhi. I think you've achieved the first step mm -hmm. uh, towards uh, financial uh, independence, uh, mm -hmm. which is at least you're aware that you need to start investing now uh, to buy a house after 10 years. So that's, that's great. Uh, and the good thing is that since you are starting early, you can take more risks. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, a significant, I, I mean, assuming, of course, you don't have any immediate liabilities, etc. Uh, you can start with a, you know, equity allocation, which is much higher than what, say, a 40-year-old person would, mm -hmm. would be entitled to, so to say. And equity over the long term, we have seen, does give uh, good compounded returns uh, uh, over a long period of time. So uh, my, my guess is that uh, you should start with a, a plain vanilla diversified fund or a flexi cap kind of a mandate. And, uh, you know, then, of course, as you uh, study the market, uh, do, do some more reading and see if there are some more thematic funds or small and mid-cap funds which you want to add to, uh, to maybe spice up the returns a bit. But uh, the core should be either a multi-cap fund or a flexi-cap fund to start with. And as you said, uh, 10,000 rupees is a good amount to start with. But I'm sure as you grow in your career, your your income will also uh, uh, increase. So that 10,000 rupees does not have to be cast in stone. Yeah. As you as you start saving more, even that amount you should keep raising and of course build a good corpus over the next 10 years. So all the best to you. Okay, fantastic Nidhi. Hopefully that will help you and good luck with those plans. Now, you know, I want to take up the, the third part, the third D, which is the due diligence and the evaluation here because I think here, uh, a lot of investors simply look at returns. They look at the, the, you know, the benchmark index return, they look at their fund, and then they'll wonder if it's good or bad. Uh, so help us out in both cases. When you're picking a brand new fund, then what's the checklist? What are the factors to consider? Maybe even costs, right? Uh, and when you're evaluating a fund that you're already invested in, then how do you decide whether to stay with it? Or you know, The temptation can al always be there, that a peer set, a category, or the, you know, similar category fund, maybe 3% more or 4% more. So, but how do you decide whether it's time to switch or just, just stay the course? Absolutely. So first of all, uh, as you rightly said, look at the benchmark. Mm -hmm. You know, not all funds are the same mm -hmm. because uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we have so much information available right now and you can sort 
and screen any kind of uh, data yeah. freely on the internet. Mm -hmm. So typically what investors tend to do is they, they tend to go on a website mm. and sort on say one year returns or six month return yeah. or five year return yeah. and, and see which fund is doing very well. Absolutely. But that's only half the picture. Yeah. The, the returns don't adjust for risk, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because it, it is possible that you're in the in the top 10 funds that you see there are some large cap funds there are some flexi cap funds there are some small cap funds and there might be absolute you know uh, out of the out of the ballpark uh, you know thematic funds which have done very well mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. uh, but the risk in a thematic fund is much different from the risk in a small cap fund sure. and it's much different from the risk in a flexi cap fund yeah. so first of all know your benchmark mm -hmm. uh, then try to evaluate the performance okay. and of course once you once you are uh, doing the due diligence what matters is the philosophy of the fund house, mm -hmm. the, who are the promoters, mm -hmm. what's the corporate governance, mm -hmm. are the fund managers experienced enough, mm -hmm. have they seen cycles, and more, more importantly, do they run their products true to label? Okay. Because there, there have been many instances where, you know, you, you suddenly see a consumer fund with a energy company in that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, is the, of yeah. course, that can work in the short term, but yeah. then you know, you're not getting what you bought. Right, uh, and right. So is, right, is the fund run in a uh, true to label? So what are the processes? What is the philosophy? Mm -hmm. What are the uh, what is the culture of the fund house? That's mo yeah. most important because mm -hmm. ultimately we can we can put anything on paper. Yeah. But it's a few people in the fund house that ultimately call the shots. So you need mm -hmm. to be aware of the promoters and the fund managers and the mm -hmm. consistency of the philosophy that they follow. Okay. Well said, and I think that's great advice to keep in mind while we are picking our funds. Uh, we do have to take a break on that note. So now we've discussed why it's important to set goals and how we start evaluating the basics of evaluating a mutual fund. On the other side, we discuss why it's also important to learn more about market cycles. As investors, we need to get more involved and evolved with our uh, investing philosophy. So we'll discuss this on the other side. Let's talk money. Welcome back. You're watching Let's Talk Money. And this week, we're in conversation with Mihir Vora and we're discussing how to go about selecting mutual funds. This is uh, a lot harder than perhaps you would consider at first glance. It's not about just getting the best tip about the best fund. You want to be more involved with the whole process. So awareness and sort of uh, getting down into the details. That's what it is all about. Now, Mihir, before we start talking about, you know, learning more about the market and cycles, etc., uh, another concept, like when we talk about stocks, you know, there are certain ratios. You need, you need to know the price to equity, uh, you know, a price to earnings uh, ratio or the ROE, etc. When we are discussing mutual funds, apart from price performance, are there any other parameters or ratios that one needs to keep in mind? Absolutely. So, as we just discussed, you know, mm -hmm. The first thing to understand is that returns should not be looked at on a standalone basis. Sure. Uh, you need to adjust for risk. Risk. And uh, you know uh, there are many uh, ratios available in the market, and again websites have it, etc. But they look very complicated. Mm -hmm. But actually, they are not very complicated. Okay. Essentially, what ratios do is look at the returns. Uh, in in for example, in the sharp ratio, mm -hmm. uh, the numerator is the excess return of the mutual fund or the portfolio compared to the risk-free rate, which is typically the government bond yield. Okay. So risk-free rate, that's the excess return. Mm -hmm. And then the denominator is the volatility of that excess return. Okay. So the excess return, is it consistent or very volatile? Okay. So okay. if the excess return of the portfolio or the risk-free rate is very high, mm -hmm. then it drags down the sharp ratio. Got it. So but because you're, you're getting the higher return, higher return with so much volatility, with so much volatility that exactly. it could really be, you know, exactly. uh, you could, it could make your heartbeat Absolutely. fluctuate. <laughs> Absolutely. Similarly, in the information ratio. So, so just to yes. complete the sharp ratio point, that means the higher the sharp ratio, the better. The better the, the fund, better. Right? Absolutely. Simple. Because okay. either your returns are much better yeah. or your volatility is much lower. Absolutely. So you yeah. are basically, in all these cases, you are adjusting for risk. Sure. Risk always comes in the denominator yeah. and the excess return or the returns come in the numerator. Got it. Similarly, in the information ratio, instead of the risk free rate, you calculate the outperformance or underperformance of the portfolio versus the benchmark. Mm -hmm. And then the numerator uh, and the denominator is the volatility or variability of the excess return versus okay. the benchmark. Okay. So in the first okay. case, it was the risk-free rate. Yeah. In the second case, you are comparing versus the benchmark. In okay. both the cases, okay. you are calculating excess returns in the yeah. numerator versus and the, the volatility. volatility in the denominator. Got it, got it. So these are some more tools to you know understand, understand. if a fund is giving you better returns, is it worth it? I mean, is it coming Correct. with less volatility? Is it still consistent or not? Correct. Uh, and so, then there's one more layer to it. Okay. 
when you are talking about the benchmark, mm -hmm. you also must understand what the benchmark is. So benchmark itself may be more volatile or less volatile. Sure. So if it's a FMCG fund, yeah. the benchmark itself will be less volatile. It'll be the you know, Nifty or the BSE sector index, the FMCG sector, index. Exactly. Yeah. Or if it, it. But if it's the uh, if it's a, say a pharmaceutical, uh, sorry, if it's a infrastructure fund mm -hmm. or a manufacturing or capital goods fund, the benchmark itself will be more volatile. Sure. So then sure, your excess sure. returns will be versus a more volatile or a less volatile benchmark. Sure, sure, sure. So some factors to keep in mind. Also, while we are discussing, uh, you know, uh, concepts around this, I want you to demystify the concept of NAV itself because there are lots of myths around it, right? Is a high NAV fund good, a low NAV fund good? So this is myth buster time then on <laughs> NAV. <laughs> Absolutely. So NAV is nothing but, you know, the assets of the fund divided by the units, uh, number mm -hmm. of units that have been mm -hmm. issued. So it doesn't really matter because every day yeah. you're issuing more units or less units sure. depending on redemptions in flow auto. Mm -hmm. So the new, uh, denominator, of course, is the number of units that the shareholders yeah. own. Mm -hmm. And the portfolio is the... Uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah. is the numerator sort of mm -hmm. denominator is the number mm -hmm. of units. So it doesn't matter whether you start at ten rupees or one hundred rupees. Correct. You know? Correct. For example, our flexi cap fund that we launched mm -hmm. uh, a couple of months ago uh, is up by ten percent mm -hmm. on a ten rupee NAV mm -hmm. right? because the markets are also yeah. plus minus ten uh, percent in that mm -hmm. same time frame. At the same time, I'm sure there are funds which had a hundred rupee NAV at that yeah. point in time. Yeah. So my ten is up to eleven, mm -hmm. and the hundred rupee NAV fund would be up to. 110. Yeah. You know. Yeah, so yeah. ultimately, the returns are similar. Exactly. But on a, on a different basis. It's, it's so, like the same so concept. So high NAV yeah. or low NAV in absolute terms doesn't, doesn't make, matter. It doesn't matter. It's like the same concept. The price of the stock per se doesn't matter whether a hundred rupees stock goes to 120 or whether a 200 rupees stock, you know, rises by the same percentage. Yeah, exactly. So so got that. Got that. So important concepts. Uh, hope our viewers are listening in carefully. Uh, now I'm here to come to the aspect of knowing more about the market as we want to evolve as investors cycles, styles, and it's getting more and more complex, right? Because you have this momentum style and the quality style and low volatility, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have different sectors. You have funds coming on infrastructure, like you said, on FMCG and pharma. So it's getting really complicated for us investors out here. How do we navigate this? No, absolutely. Uh, so, mm -hmm. you know, there are two things that we already discussed. Mm -hmm. In the first part, which was uh, defining your goals, mm -hmm. the first thing was know yourself, mm -hmm. uh, right? Uh, second was know the fund house or the fund manager, yeah. right? And in, in this, you actually need to know the characteristics of the underlying asset classes. Sure, you know? sure. So we've seen that, you know, no style or sector performs consistently over each period of time. Sure, so if, sure. you, if you even look at a longer term of one year kind of returns, mm -hmm. you've seen, for example, uh, from 2012-13 to say 2020, mm -hmm. private banks did very well. Yeah. You know, then low volatility stocks, high quality stocks did very well. Mm. But for the last four or five years, mm. we actually see momentum and high beta stocks do very Absolutely. well. Uh, metals have suddenly done well. For almost eight years, uh, uh, IT was a, a big underperformer, mm -hmm. right? From mm -hmm. 2012, 13 to almost yeah. 18, 19, yeah. 20. But uh, in the last uh, three years, IT did very well. Mm. So no one uh, value, momentum, uh, you know, quality low volatility, these are all different styles and strategies which can work at different points in time. Mm -hmm. So either you as an investor uh, take up the onus on yourself mm -hmm. to decide, try to figure Sounds out which, which, which styles you're going to work <laughs> or you leave it to the fund manager. Sure, sure, sure. Got so, it. Uh, so as I said, by default, you should go for a diversified fund that mm -hmm. should always be, whether it's a large cap fund or a yeah. flexi cap fund or a multi cap fund, yeah. that has to be the core holding yeah. in, in your portfolio. Yeah. And then the extra kicker based on your or your, your knowledge financial advisor or, you know, or knowledge, you can yeah, play. Yeah. That's where the thematic funds come in. Uh -huh. You know, uh, suppose you are really bullish on the manufacturing theme for the next mm. five years. Mm. You might want to put some part of your portfolio, but not a big chunk of your portfolio in that theme. But then that portion you will have to actively uh, actively monitor and manage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It so, can't be a buy and hold. So, you know, I actually have a quick question on thematics and maybe you can quickly take this up. Last few minutes left on the show. This is from Shabin. Uh, she is a viewer and she's, uh, you know, asking... How can I select a sectoral mutual fund if I want to weave it in in my long-term investment portfolio? And can I actually look forward to more appreciation if I add thematics? I think it's a very relevant question. Absolutely. Uh, so what should the approach be? So, see, that's what I'm saying. Uh, when you're choosing a diversified fund, mm. flexi cap or large mm -hmm. cap or you know, a multi-cap fund, mm. the decision to go for a particular theme or a sector lies with the fund manager. Mm. But when you're selecting a thematic fund, the decision to go in that theme or that sector is yours. So if you want to choose a sector fund, you have to then yourself do a good analysis of the, of the sector, uh, take a view on that sector, and then actively monitor it. You mm. can't just you know, buy and hold it. Mm. 
Yeah. Uh, because uh, the decision to go for that theme or that sector is yours. Hmm. Okay. Mayor, it's been a great classroom, lots of concepts, but we now want to recap. And also maybe, you know, the stuff to do and also the stuff not to do, the mistakes to avoid. So in a nutshell, if you could sum it up for us. Uh, see, as I said, uh, mm -hmm. you need to have a plan. Yeah. Uh, follow up on the plan and monitor the plan mm -hmm. on a re, uh, re mm -hmm. on a periodic basis. Uh, and look, uh, and just focus on the basics. Don't over-concentrate in... Mm -hmm one fund or one stock or one fund house mm. diversified across a few funds but then don't over diversify also mm. so take a few funds uh, monitor them closely and once a year just see whether things are going as planned mm -hmm. and rebalance it so that's mm -hmm. that's uh, that's one second is do not ignore uh, other asset classes for okay. example debt fund is a significant category sure. that can also add stability and you know a regular income to your mm -hmm. portfolio mm -hmm. sometimes people mistake mutual funds as only equity funds yeah. but debt fund is also an asset class thinking that way just stock market stock market so debt fund yeah. is another asset yeah. class that yeah. uh, one should look at mm -hmm. so those are the basics one should you know uh, mm -hmm. take care of while uh, building the portfolio so before i end because mehir is the big boss at uh, trust mutual fund you tell us personally what funds do you like to be in and for your personal investing style what what kind of funds do you have your money in <laughs> so my my uh, big money is of course in my own fund which is, and we only have one fund at this point in time which is okay. a taxi cap fund uh -huh. and little bit in the other fund because anyway skin in the game mm -hmm. demands that we put yeah. money into the other income funds also mm -hmm. so right now most of my mutual fund investments are uh, are in the flexi flexi cap category of course okay <laughs> all right um, hey, great conversation thank you so much for joining in and you know uh, busting some of those myths and also giving us some very important concepts investing in mutual funds really 101 thank you so much thank you for having me always a pleasure <laughs> all right uh, we Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.